informal meeting of the members of the Leeds District Consultative Subcommittee. And you're just getting a message now saying it's been live streamed. So some people may want to turn the, the video off. Um, my name is Mark Parry. I'm the Deputy Chair and Councillor Lou Cunningham can't make it today. So that's uh, one apology we've got. Um, but uh, before we get to apologies, the first item on the agenda is the open forum. And uh, this is where we is a, a, a free session for people to fire any questions they want to. So I suggest we use the reactions raise hand uh, button, which for most people, um, as you move your mouse, is on the bottom of the screen and the raise hand facilities is on there. So anyone who's got any burning questions now, if you want to raise your hand, I know we'll listen to what you've got to ask. Right, so Clive, do you want to make a start? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, some items from our last meeting back in October, um, which I, I just wondered if any progress had been made on them. Uh, obviously, with COVID and uh, the, the sort of cutbacks in services uh, as part of uh, the response due to staff shortages, um, I did suggest that it would be useful if cancellations, if we had a spreadsheet of where cancellations occurred. And the reason for that was, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, my bus, which is only now th every 30 minutes, um, had been cancelled, so it was an hour wait effectively. So I just happened to look at the interactive map just to see how cancellations were spread throughout throughout Leeds. And there didn't seem to be any pattern, and I thought there could be a pattern, such a pattern. Um, so frequent services didn't have any cancellations, perhaps a ten minute service. But then I came across an hourly service, and one had been cancelled. So clearly the impact can be much greater. And it does seem quite sensible to me. And I think the chair, Lou Cunningham, had said it was a good idea that we had um, a spreadsheet so we knew for each service when cancellations occurred. I mean, the pattern might give a clue as to why, and then one could work on that to improve the situation. And so I've allied to that, the other suggestion I made was that uh, services pre-COVID and now existing services should also be available for the public to see. I and mean, if we're trying to increase um, bus usage, then reduced services due to COVID need to be restored and a spreadsheet showing what the services were pre and post obviously shows that we're actually achieving that. So those were two things uh, I raised. And the third I raised, um, which I think deserves a study, was the discrepancy between fa train fares. This was a train issue. And the problem, certainly people in Horsforth and Airborough have, of people driving from North Yorkshire, where there are stations, of course, at Harrogate, Wheaton, Panel, but driving to Horsforth to park. And why do they do that? Because the fares are about half or even greater um, than those in North Yorkshire. I mean, in North Yorkshire, Harrogate, there's a parking cost as well. And of course, in, in West Yorkshire, there isn't. I don't believe this is confined to Horsforth. I think it happens on other um, areas. And it's particularly pertinent at the moment because, of course, there are plans to have a park and ride at Leeds Bradford Airport. And if the current uh, situation isn't changed, then all that will be uh, will be a service to North Yorkshire taxpayers to drive into Leeds Bradford Airport, fill it up. And who's financing that? Well, it isn't North Yorkshire. And it adds even worse, given the climate emergency and pollution, it adds to traffic on already congested roads. So those were things I raised before. Um, Dave Pearson, who is responsible for buses, wasn't there, so that may mean they haven't been followed up. But I do think it's quite important that we are transparent and we actually have an opportunity to see progress. 
so those are the three things I raised before. There was one other thing I did want to raise, but perhaps um, I could have responses to those first three first, yeah. please. Can we just deal with one at a time of those? The first one was uh, a record of cancellations. Now, I note in the, the minutes to the meeting, uh, there was a reassurance that cancellations are noted. Um, but it didn't actually mention about provide. I think you want data to be provided to us, don't you? Yeah, that'd be helpful because then you can yeah. see where the problems are. And I suppose if it's the same one every week that's been cancelled, you avoid going there in the worst case scenario. But I think the driver situation is much improved, though our colleagues right. uh, okay. will uh, be able to see. Andrew, is that something you can help with? Yeah, I it certainly can. I mean, I certainly think that operators have got better and more efficient at recording cancellations using the real-time system. And uh, as Clive says, the driver shortages are less acute than they were, although it's uh, it's a bit hit and miss. Some operators are still suffering far more than other operators are. Um, so so we are, we're not out of the woods yet. And I think it's worth noting that uh, I mean, certainly my personal experience is that quite a few people have been getting COVID in, in recent weeks uh, or in, even in recent days. So I could well expect that we will see another resurgence of people off work and, and operators may wish to, bus or rail may wish to verify whether that's actually their experience. In terms of the, the recording of cancellations, I'm pretty sure that the operators do make a record, take a recording of all services that don't run Um and for whatever reason, and, and and keep a record of that and report that. And I'm sure it's something that we can do either in concert with them or uh, or for them to provide that information directly. But I'll hand over to to perhaps Dwayne and Will in the first instance to perhaps give some insight into, uh, or maybe Paul, as to whether that's possible or not. Um. Yep, sure. Well, Will Pearson, Head of Operations for FIRST, of course, uh, we, we do record all cancellations, um, uh, as, as Andrew says, via the real-time system, and we have a, a mileage recording uh, system that also records mileage run and mileage operated and where mileage is lost. So we certainly have those records and we can talk to stakeholders and the combined authority on, on how best to present that. Uh, that data and and Andrew is, is absolutely right in the uh, from a staffing perspective and I will, I, will, I will talk about this during the updates but yes there are pockets now appearing where there is a slight increase in cases of, of COVID impacting us on the day. Okay. And, uh, just about... so could that yeah, be, sorry. sorry, could that be in the public domain? Uh, and it, it, it's a pre-COVID issue as well. I mean, it isn't just a cancellation. It's often congestion issues, in fact. But uh, if that could be transparently in the public domain, that would be extremely useful. Uh, if we can give a chance for Dwayne to comment. Uh, in, a, in a very similar way to First Bus, so we um, we 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 put our our cancellations on our on our app, so that in a live environment, passengers can see exactly what journey is running and what journey isn't, as you say, Clive, so that they can they can plan their journey. Um, in terms of um, in terms of um, uh, sort of a a, um, a post review as to as to what services are um, are struggling with cancellations more, of course we we do have that data. We we regularly review that with our um, with our depot teams to ensure that the um, uh, ensure that any trends are picked up and we can um, we actively change timetables to accommodate those uh, um, uh, those issues. Um, I think from a um, uh, from sort of a general point as to as to how we approach cancellations, um, it's always the services that um, are the more infrequent services that are prioritised, as you would expect, because there's a longer wait if, uh, if that journey is cancelled. Um, and certainly that that is obviously quite um, quite something that is seen on our on our stats and, and how we manage things. Um, and in a similar way to first, we're more than happy to work with the command authority. Um, I mean, incidentally, we do we do share the the totality of, of cancelled uh, cancel mileage with the command authority and we track that each month as part of the bus alliance um, but by all means if we want to go into a bit further detail as to as to where and when we're quite happy to do that okay thank you um i think the second point clive was the comparison of pre and post covid of bus frequencies i think the the burning question is when 
frequencies can can they be restored? And um, we would need to get. I'm, I'm aware of certain my services which have been reduced, of course. And it's getting more and more difficult to keep in your head. All the cuts have been made, and we're anxious to make sure they are fully restored. Um, so again, I think to to Andrew, is there some sort of record being kept of that? Oh, there absolutely is a record being kept of which services are being um, which services are being withdrawn on, uh, on a temporary basis and indeed on a permanent basis. The the reality is, we the funding situation is very acute acute at the moment, and uh, whilst the government has committed to continuing funding services until the autumn, we don't know what's going to what will be the case then. Um, and we don't know how much money will be in the system and we don't know the extent to which uh, bus services will have been able to recover to full commercial viability. That means without the levels of uh, public funding that they've received in the last couple of years. So uh, whilst absolutely, I think all of our will and ambition and aim is for those services to be fully restored. The reality is from where we sit today, we can't say with entire confidence that they will be because we simply don't know how much money is in the system or will okay. be in the system. Okay. Um, so is there some sort of um, record that can be presented to us? Is there a list of reductions? Yes, I don't, I don't see that as being a problem at all. Uh, we, we can provide that. I mean, it is in, in a sense in the public domain already and the operators have to register any service reductions that they make um, and uh, the other thing to note is that we are uh, going to be undertaking a review of, of bus services across the West Yorkshire region in any event um, and that will help the combined authority to inform the decisions that it might need to make in terms of subsidising services where it hasn't done in the past to make sure that we're able to prioritise the most important services. Now, of course, most important is a, is a subjective statement um, and there will always be people who are disappointed, but um, we will use a set of criteria to determine which services we have to keep in and which services we, for whatever reason, well, for funding reasons, are not able to maintain. Okay, thanks. Uh, and the last point, Clive, was about... Uh, the differential in rail fares between North and West Yorkshire and the, the behaviour that's driven by that is to encourage much more driving from North Yorkshire into West Yorkshire. Um, I think this is probably um, a more difficult thing. It's something that we're, we're going to have to look a bit more broadly. It's probably to do with how the central government provides funding, I would imagine. Um, again, Andrew, is that something why it has any control over at all? Well, yes, it is. Um, and, I, and I think one of the challenges around park and ride, and it's not just Leeds Bradford Airport, it's any park and ride, frankly, is that is that the objective of a park and ride service is to prevent people or encourage people, dissuade people rather, from driving further into an urban centre than they would otherwise do were parking to be free in the city centre or um, were there to be no congestion on the roads or et cetera, et cetera. So if you can provide parking for those people, accepting that they are people that are coming from further away on the outskirts of your area, then hopefully the networks that we rely on, the highway networks that we rely on further into the city centre, which do become very heavily congested, particularly to the north of Leeds, uh, as we know, will be protected somewhat. That is the theory. I appreciate that it is not uh, without flaw, but that's the theory at least. In terms of the, the rail parking, uh, you're right, that is a really difficult challenge. And the uh, Combined Authority has commissioned a park and ride strategy for the whole of West Yorkshire to look into bus and rail-based park and ride and to inform what we do going forward. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's going to be a difficult one to resolve, isn't it? And I think it needs sort of input from North Yorkshire and, and the National Rail Network as well. Uh, I would imagine when the Great British Railways start reviewing the fare structure, 
things might uh, change possibly. Um, if I can move then now to Howard, you've got a question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a member of the Leeds Civic Trust Transport Group and uh, recently we've had a discussion about the new bus maps and signage. Uh, and although we welcome the approach, uh, we do feel that there are some major issues uh, with them. Um, so I'll, I'll, first of all, I'll, I'll give a few examples. Um, we feel that the map um, falls between stools, potentially, but it's neither a full map, bus map of the city, uh, nor, nor a really a, a map of all the, the high frequency routes. Um, so, so in some senses, it's a bit arbitrary as to what's been included uh, in the suburbs. Um, so, for example, there's no bus service shown on the A61 Scott Hall Road, although there are actually four buses per hour right up to Moortown. And it, it actually used to be every 10 minutes, but for some reason it seems to have been airbrushed out, as it were. Um, and there are also large areas of North Leeds which appear not to have a bus service at first sight, uh, but, but, but there are bus services, albeit uh, less frequent. Uh, there's also no indication that there are any auto orbital routes, uh, which really are crucial uh, to providing an alternative uh, to people for using their cars. Um, turning to signage, uh, on some of the signs, the 7A and the 7S buses are listed as being part of the Meanwood line, but they don't actually go anywhere near Meanwood. Uh, we also feel that the font size on the signs is too small to be but clearly visible. Um, another issue from another part of Leeds is that bus service number one changes colour as it goes through Leeds, uh, which perhaps raises a, some uh, issues in its own right. Uh, so so we've, we've documented these issues, so, so I suppose what's the best way for us to, 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 to raise them? Should we send them to somebody? And I suppose, it is, is there a process to, to look at rectifying uh, the, any problems that may exist? Chair, yeah, if I may, yeah. a, a, absolutely there is. Um, the, the, the process isn't perfect when it's done that. It's, it's been an it's pro, iterative process to deliver what we've delivered. And we think it, it is a vast improvement on what was there previously. Absolutely, we acknowledge, or I acknowledge, what you what you say. Um, in terms of the the, the uh, information that you've documented, by all means, if you could email it to me, that would be great. Um, and I'm I'll, I'll put my uh, email address in the chat so that you've got that if you haven't got that already. Um, and and I think that way we can take a look at all of the rather than going through them now, all of the individual suggestions that you make and 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 cover them off can't promise to to change all of the suggestions that you, you, you've made but certainly we will look at them okay thank you okay so no doubt howard you can forward the details um right uh, kim groves are you thank you I, I was just going to come back on that we always welcome feedback and it's very timely because we're about to roll the maps out across wet, the whole of west yorkshire they, are, they can always be adapted and changed because obviously we need an integrated plan that connects all modes. Um, but what I would say is um, it's really good that you've brought this to the table because we we haven't hardly had any complaints about the maps. Uh, the public seem to have picked them up. So for you to do that in-depth desktop study that you've done, that you know, is really welcome. So thank you. Look forward to looking a bit deeper into that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Clive? Yeah, the, the other new item that I hadn't mentioned before uh, concerns, well, my, my background actually, the congestion problems that uh, do occur uh, on the outskirts of Leeds, and this is Airbra, and uh, our bugbear for many years has been the Horsteth Roundabout, and there have been two attempts to improve it. But in terms of queues from Rawdon to the roundabout, they stretch back half a mile and it's actually much worse than it was. I mean, it's much worse than the queues on the ring road. Now, just before Christmas, um, there was a very brief consultation about improving the Horseforth roundabout, which I thought, great, it's going to be solved because that had been promised before. So it was really very, very disappointing to see what is proposed. Just a couple of 
um, a, a short section of dual carriageway going um, towards Rodley. Um, and I know it sometimes blocks there, but that's not the basic problem. Um, and it's not going to solve uh, the queues back to Rawdon. And the big concern is our effect on our bus services. So this affects the airport bus service. I don't know whether um, they're with us this afternoon. And also the first bus services, 33 and 34, because a lot of our cancellations are due to late running due to this unpredictable queuing, which can take 20 minutes. Now, it really does, if we're trying to try and get people to use buses, then we really should, if we're doing highway schemes, uh, make sure that buses do benefit. And it seems looking at this um, proposal that uh, it is not going to do anything for the main bus routes from Airborough into Leeds. And so more people will take to their cars and the problem would be increased. So the scheme needs looking at again. I don't know that Weicker looked at it in the first place. And I guess it's only people who live locally and use it um, really understand the impact that it has um, on our public transport. Yeah, I, th I think there's a, also the issue here that we want to see traffic reduction rather than more tarmac on the on the ground. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of authorities have got these reduction targets. It would seem a waste of money to start dueling roads. Uh, and, uh, of course, that leads to more traffic in the long term. So, I, I mean, Andrew, what, what is the, the solution in the short term with this? Is the one? I'm sorry, I'm not desperately familiar with the, the specific example. And I don't know, Kate Morris, I think, is on the call. So she on might be able call. to provide us yeah. with some background to it. I am on the call, yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Can, can you see me? Yeah, yep. fine. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yes, yeah, so we are going out to consultation on that. I, I, said, I would say that generally, given, given what, where the funding comes from now, um, that actually for all our schemes, we look to try to deliver betterment for buses, betterment for active travel. So as, as was said, by and large, we're not providing additional capacity for vehicles through these junctions. They're often quite complex in terms of the way that the signals work. So sometimes it can be counterintuitive in terms of we may provide um, additional capacity on a different part of the roundabout rather than the access to that, which actually enables it to work more efficiently. But if you've got any specific things that you'd like to feed back, um, we can feed that back through the Connecting Leads platform that we've got. I can provide some details in there. By all means, put those comments through. And what we can do is look at those as, as part of all the other comments that were coming through. Um, I think the other thing to add to that is that if there are things there that you see do support what you're launching in terms of enhanced capacity for the buses and the walking and the cycling, please put in those positive comments. Um, because often we, we struggle, I suppose, in terms of often the car drivers are quite a vocal community, shall we say. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd actually encourage you to, to provide those positive elements as well. But if I've got the link, I'll put that in the chat that you can send that through. And I'll put my details in as well if you just want to send them directly to me and then I can pass them on to the relevant team doing the, the design elements of it. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Kate. Um, right, Howard again. Yes, uh, uh, another question. Um, uh, it's about uh, rail this time. Um, I noticed on the list of schemes that work on the new station at White Rose is due to start quite soon. And, and that's clearly to be welcomed. Um, my question is that following the announcement last autumn, uh, rightly or wrongly, that uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail from Leeds to, to Manchester is going to use that line, have the plans for the station been reviewed to ensure that they remain robust uh, given that change of demand on that line? Uh, and I suppose just to say a bit more detail about where I'm coming from, um, uh, looking at the, the Weicker Rail Vision, uh, page 68 to be precise, it envisages that the majority of stations on core radial routes into Leeds will be served by four trains per hour. So I assume the intention would be for four trains per hour between Dewsbury and Leeds, serving Batley, Morley and White Rose. 
So I suppose clearly with the additional traffic um, from Northern Powerhouse Rail, uh, there's a danger that that stretch of track, which is uh, two tracks, could be a bottleneck, um, but maybe there might be four tracks needed, uh, ideally in the future. Um, uh, I understand that the, the station plans for Fort Park uh, enable the, the platforms to be moved back in the future so that a four track line could be accommodated. Uh, so I suppose, do the plans for White Rose make similar provision uh, cl clearly, we don't want to be building a station which is going to be, have to be knocked down for five years uh, in time uh, for Northern Powerhouse Rail, or, or that's going to end up being a bottleneck on capacity um, and preventing an increase in the frequency of, of trains. Uh, right. Uh, is that one for you, Andrew? Or? Uh, possibly Councillor Groves, I'm hoping, because uh, she's got her hand up. Oh, right. OK, sorry. So, so obviously you're right, um, the White Rose Station is great news and we're just in the final stages of the Grant 2 agreement to get those shovels in the ground and hopefully we will have it delivered within three years. Originally I do believe we were looking at two, two trains per hour on that route and so, so that's what we're working on at this moment in time. I would say, obviously, I was really new into this role about three years ago, but the way that um, services are being withdrawn um, across the whole of, of the network is, is concerning. And I think we can't make any predictions because of um, the new working patterns and, and the different sort of demands on rail and the leisure market in particular. So we, we will be reviewing all the time and, and certainly there's feasibility work being done around the IRP and Northern Rail um, by Network Rail and the four tracking east of Leeds. So we're still in um, conversations with Fort Park um, with the Scarborough Group about a contribution to that station. So there's nothing more that I can update you on, but obviously we would want for tracking and we want, would want to get the most out of the railways. And I think it just goes back to the conversation that we've just had around congestion and people using buses. We simply have to get people out of cars. We need, simply need to get people onto public transport. And I'd, the vision that we set out in the West Yorkshire Rail Vision, absolutely right. The service levels there is, is what actually we feel we need across West Yorkshire, and we shouldn't rein back on that aspiration in any way, shape or form. So, okay, so thanks. If our rail operators want to come in on that one. Um, I mean, there's one question I'd like to ask in, in view of potential for tracking in the future is that it's a shame we have to close Cottonley because we're unable to find the timings to get call-ins, uh, at least a couple of call-ins an hour, uh, if eventually it's going to be four tracks. So I don't know what your comments are on that, Kim. Well, I think in terms of the new station, we've done all the consultation with local residents. And obviously I live in the south of the city, so very close mm. to Cottingley. And um, I think the, the new station will provide a safe um, and um, high standard facility with all the access that is needed of a new modern station. Um, the numbers at Cotting were very low. I think actually moving the station will mean we'll see increased um, usage of, of that rail station. It's really strange because a lot of people in South Leeds don't even know that Cotting station exists. I can tell you that when White Rose opens, I think there'll be a big push for four trains per hour because that will open up so many opportunities for the people of South Leeds, not just on employment and education, but on leisure as well. So um, I think, yeah, it's always sad when you lose a station, but you know, um, as time tells us, we often go back and revisit things, um, but I really welcome the, uh, you know, the biggest investment we've had on, in transport in South Leeds in decades, so. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pete Myers. Yeah, just quickly uh, to talk about that one. 
it, well, I don't think that the track would be, it wouldn't really be possible to make it four track there because it's on a huge viaduct, uh, sorry, a huge embankment. So the costs would be huge. You'd probably end up knocking down most of White Rose to do it, uh, which is, is not practical. But obviously, um, the signaling is also being changed as part of the whole Trans Pennine route upgrade program. And this will enable more trains to run on, on the existing infrastructure, which will hopefully uh, enable us to call more frequently in, in the future. But uh, that station has been uh, built and planned with Trans Pennine route upgrade in mind. So the, to, to answer the original question, yes, it is. Uh, it, it's all part of it. And it's certainly included in the uh, in the planning for it. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions for this open session? If not, we'll uh, move on. So thanks for all those. Um, the next item is apologies for absence. Um, the, I've got apologies from Brittany Stead. Um, bear with me. Uh, from Councillor Lou Cunningham, of course, and Councillor Helen Hayden. Uh, I don't know if there are any other uh, apologies, Ian. Uh, no, none, none more than that. That was all okay. of them. Chair, it's not an apology for absence, but I'm going to go and do the school run now. I should be right. back as soon as possible after 3 pm. We'll see you soon. Then, all right. Andrew. Cheers. Bye bye. Uh, the next one is any declarations of disclosable funerary interests? which is a, a tongue twister they try and fool most chairs with. But if anyone wants to declare anything, please say so now. And uh, exempt information, the possible inclusion of press and public, well, most of us are, half of us are public anyway, so I assume nothing applies there as well. Uh, we issued notes on the last meeting um, and um, I assume everyone's read them. Uh, are there any comments people want to raise about those notes? Going back quite a while, actually, uh, October, so much has happened since then. The world is moving very quickly. Um, so I, I am assuming that there are no comments on them. Um, at this point, we're going to have a presentation by Andrew, but he is, is obviously going to be coming back later. Uh, the chair's update, uh, well, Lou Cunningham isn't here, uh, and I don't have anything I particularly uh, can update you on. Um, there is, however, the information report, which also went out in with the papers. I think if I just raise uh, each item, just to make sure there's no questions. The first is the Leeds bus station and the refurbishment on it. Uh, any issues there? Uh, there's the Infirmary Street and Park Row. We've had some wonderful improvements to the streets in Leeds. Um, We've got the corn exchange scheme, but of course that's still uh, barriered off and uh, about to be completed. But uh, if you've got any issues, now's the time. The Leeds City Rail Station in the surrounding area. No comments. Uh, other connecting Leeds projects. Um, I'm one of the few people who, who dares to use the, the, the cross pedestrian cross on the hedgerow. Um, you feel as though you're taking your life in your hands, but the green man is definitely on. I have used it. Um, the Leeds City Centre cycle improvements on Dewsbury Road. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, a bit of road is being removed in the just where the, the, the entrance to the motorways are. Um, that's a proposal anyway, to allow more cycleways. So that's a, a good, uh, good thing. So that's the information report. Um, we now move on to operator updates. Um, um, perhaps we could start with Pete Myers at Northern, please. 
Certainly can chair. Just a short one this time. Um, if I start, I normally start with performance, so I'll do that again. Performance is has, has been challenging uh, due to um, staff shortages over the winter. This started off, well, and is still COVID-based, really. A number of people away from the workplace uh, with COVID. But equally, we have um, we are still recovering from about a year's worth of no training for drivers back in 2020 and, and during the, the heart of the uh, pandemic. We, we got training back last year, about this time last year, but it, it's, we, we've, got to, we've got to catch up and that has been causing the problems. So much so that we're, we're running on a reduced timetable, which will now carry on through the summer. Uh, and, and details of that have been shared with uh, WICA. And I can't overemphasize really this, the issues that this, um, this training piece is causing us. Uh, we also are currently have a rest day working ban by other drivers and their trades unions as left, which normally would just be a, a nuisance to us. But now with the shortage of uh, trained drivers and the, uh, the fact that our... We still have people away from work due to COVID. It, it's causing a significant issue to which we are working through. In fairness to the trades union, we're certainly speaking to them, and it, it sounds quite encouraging going forward. Customer numbers are not what they were, but they're encouraged. Uh, they, but we, there are certainly green shoots as far as they're concerned. We're sitting at about eighty percent of our pre-COVID figures as things stand this week. However. Beneath that, there's some interesting changes. Season ticket holders, commuters are well short of 40% of what we would expect. And uh, not so many years ago, they were the reason for existence as far as Northern was concerned. But as Councillor Groves mentioned earlier, that the working patterns have changed and people aren't travelling as much as they were, certainly not daily. So the season tickets perhaps aren't the product that people need anymore. We are seeing an interesting up, uh, upturn in use, probably midweek, which is probably indicative of people who are coming into the office um, maybe Wednesday or Thursday during the week and then working from home the rest of the week. Um, but what we are seeing a big upturn is leisure travel. And that um, currently, that is leisure travel to go um, to visit retail opportunities all over the place. Uh, but as the weather gets nicer, and we certainly saw it this weekend, uh, as the weather was quite nice yesterday, wasn't it? We saw people travelling um, to traditional leisure uh, places. The Dales are very popular, and the Settlement Carlisle line and the Leeds, Leeds Morecambe line are very popular. And of course, the coast, uh, travel out to the coast it will be increasingly popular as the summer goes on. Uh, one thing we are seeing as well is an, a sizable upturn in pre-booked or advanced purchase tickets. There are some really good deals on this, and so it's not surprising that people are using them. But the numbers uh, going up are really interesting, and it's about 150% of what we saw pre-COVID. So that that that's great because it means people are traveling, but it also enables us to uh, flex our resources much, much better because clearly if, if a lot of people are travelling, we can either remove inexpensive fares uh, when football matches and local derbies are on or we can we can encourage people and, and move them onto less busy trains. So that's working really well indeed. Capacity at the moment is okay. We're not seeing any pinch points of capacity. Our biggest line is uh, York leads via not via Harrogate but by the main line that is very very that is busy I'll say very very busy it's not very very busy uh, and Leeds Nottingham is busy both Leeds to Sheffield and Sheffield to Nottingham it, it, it's probably two flows there but they're they're our busiest flows at the moment and new trains help us no end here because they're all fitted with uh, automatic train counting which gives us lots of rich data, which we can use uh, to design the timetable and also ensure we've got correct capacity where we need it. Chair, that's it for my report. Happy to take any questions, should there be any. Okay. Uh, there's quite a few uh, temporary cuts, uh, I know, which are coming in May. 
uh, and I think I'm right in saying the Huddersfield to Castleford route isn't running again. That's Is there correct. going to be some promotion when these things are restored? I'm just concerned that the goodwill will have been lost. No, it will. Yes, it will. And indeed, even before then, we are certainly promoting rail travel now widely. This time last year, we couldn't. But we have, uh, we, you know, we put, <laughs> we're putting posters up at bottlenecks, tra uh, car traffic bottlenecks and things like that to actively encourage commuters back. We would never have needed to uh, promote travel to commuters um, back in the day because, frankly, we didn't have the capacity. But now we do. And yes, we are. And, and yes, when routes come back, as they no doubt will, we, we need to promote them and to get, encourage people to use them once again. Okay. Uh, Leslie's got a question for you, I believe. Yeah, I just wonder whether Pete might like to say something about the very uh, welcome work that Northern's doing on um, uh, converting stock to take more bicycles. Um, I know that uh, work's underway, and uh, uh, I want to comment on that, Pete. The other, the other thing that uh, I welcome is the new Northern website, which is looking much smarter now, and uh, uh, and it has some very good stuff about cycle rail uh, travel. So it doesn't really, really not questions. These are really <laughs> commendations. <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, the new website is new and. Uh, it was the old one was much easier to update for me. I just come off a weekend on call, and the new one's <laughs> more difficult. But I'll no doubt you get used to it. But yes, and, and and cycle provision that's all part of the leisure market, isn't it? Because the leisure market is changing or is becoming more important. So we we have to. It's difficult because uh, bikes take up space, but we need to make it as easy as possible for people to travel with their cycles, especially, as I say, to the place like the Dales, which is increasingly popular. Okay, thank you. Uh, while we're on to trains, uh, Melissa Farmer, can you update us on Transfer 9, please? Perhaps she's not there just at the moment. We'll come back to her. Um, perhaps we can go to first bus. Uh, Will Pearson, please. Sorry, sure. sorry my, apo my apologies. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, it's sorry. Myself. Yeah, yes. OK, sorry. Um, we'll, we'll stay with trains then, Melissa. If you can update us yeah, on Yeah, no problem. What I, will, what, I will, what, what I will say is I'm, I'm standing in for Graham today and it was quite last minute, so I'm actually on a train myself. So... It's probably best if I don't give a verbal update and maybe just put some notes into the chat. Is that okay? And then anybody can ask me anything. Just okay. conscious that I'm I'm on a train. Okay, so okay. I'll, drop, well, I'll drop some updates in and then people can ask questions then. Is that okay? That's fine. We'll, we'll look out for those. Uh, right, Thank sorry, you. Will. Uh, perhaps you can update us now on first bus. Okay, mute. Okay, sure. Um, well, of course, the, the, the key thing on, on all of our radars right now is the service levels and what drives that is our driving position. Um, and, and by that, I mean the numbers, the recruitment and, and what we're doing about it and what we have done so far. So um, as, as we're very, very well aware, we have reduced some timetables and made those adjustments, typically frequency reductions in leads. Um, and, and, and as we, we appear to be uh, coming out of the pandemic, the demand remains very different to, to what we saw when we went into the pandemic. Um, so it is reduced at different times of day and, and what have you. We've definitely seen a shift towards the leisure. Um, and as others have said already, that once the weather starts to pick up and the year progresses, we're going to see how, how this all develops. Um, from a recruitment perspective, we've got a good pipeline. We've got a lot of interest in people wanting to come into the industry, uh, which is great. Um, we, we're starting to see the licenses uh, returning from DVLA much quicker than they were some time ago. So certainly towards autumn of last year, it was, it was actually pretty horrific, taking sometimes three months for some licenses to be processed when normally it would take maybe three weeks. So it, it's great that we're... 
we are where we are in terms of those returnees and then we're in a process of doing two things within our West Yorkshire um, training team and that is converting a huge cost a number of vehicles to to enhance the training fleet and we're also recruiting for some new training and recruitment officers to further strengthen that team so that we can continue our peak demand as the as the weeks and months progress because we do see this challenge continuing for uh, probably for the re remainder of the year before we can get back to the numbers that we really want to get to um we're, we're looking at what our people actually do and how we advertise and um, we're, we're working on some part-time working plans flexible working arrangements in order to attract that wider group of people that might not fancy the the whole shift based piece that works um, effectively let's face it the industry covers um, seven days a week 20 hours a day so it's an awful lot of shifts that we we have to cover but we're trying to capture and just widen the net um, just on that flexible working and, and, and part-time working, we do actually allow a fair amount of that already. You know, we've got a huge degree of that at all of our sites in West Yorkshire, and um, it does help us to retain our people. And, of course, working with partners, some people on this call, we're, we're part of the West Yorkshire Bus Jobs piece of work. As far as passengers are concerned, recovery in Leeds is hovering in around the mid-80s, and that's quite, um, quite a jump over the last month or so, because um, uh, checking the numbers just four weeks ago, we were in the mid 70s. So if that continues at that pace, then that's really, really good news for us, for us all. One thing that we are seeing, though, is a particular group, and that's the concessionary users. They are definitely standing out as the group of people and not returning as quickly as others. So um, perhaps the wider, the wider team, um, perhaps some people on this call can, can consider that. And maybe we need to think about um, how we can actually encourage um, those people to return to bus uh, usage. So what have we been doing? Um, well, I think we're all aware that we've introduced some new fares, a new fare structure, which is simpler and cheaper and fairer. Uh, there are some winners and losers, as, as there always will be in, in fare changes, uh, but particularly there are some um, more flexible offers, three and five day tickets and, and the like. We've also introduced tap on, tap off, which is seeing encouraging use. And we are looking at returns being added to that facility at the end of April. We're going to be reviewing our evening offer um, that's been in place since before Christmas. Um, and we're looking at our new corporate travel club offer for, for businesses and, and um, for that group of people. Um, and particularly, there's gonna be some flexible tickets added to that. Um, one of the fear factors that I guess anybody driving anything these days is everything around fuel. And, and just to give some, some confidence, um, certainly we in first hedge most of our fuel and that strategy should help mitigate any of the risks that we've got from the short-term volatility in that in that market. Um, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a thing that we're all sort of looking at. If anybody who drives is, is seeing that difference um, aligned with the cost of living. Um, obviously, we welcome the announcement with regards to funding the 150 million pound funding packages uh, package over six months, and let's see where the distribution um, goes on that. Um, there's a number of other things, um, but principally the Temple Green extension is now open. That's good. Um, let's hope that some of the work and, and some of the comments that Andrew was making earlier around that encouragement of people not to be coming into the city centre, uh, but to start to use the park and rides again. Um, they're starting to grow a bit slowly. That extension is a really important piece. It became extremely busy and, and very successful. Um, Pre-COVID, did Temple Green for a, for a new site. Um, that was um, so, so that's something that we're, we're keeping an eye on. And then finally, our expansion of the customer services live chat this year, um, a date to be confirmed, but we will be looking at longer hours, including weekends. And, and that's my update for now. And I look forward to any questions. Uh, if we could sort of put you on the spot and can you sort of um, estimate when you think services are likely to be restored, you know, the, the 10 minute frequencies and such like? Well, I think the risk that we've got there is is what I and others have said in that we've already just seen um, within the last couple of weeks a little bit of a bounce back as far as the pandemic is concerned. So mm -hmm. I, 
I'm not going to sit here and and predict when when that might happen for 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 all the reasons that are fairly obvious. It, it's so unpredictable right now. You know the impact on um, on us in any labour intensive environment um, with the the easing of restrictions is great news for everyone. But the problem is that it then generates increased circulation potentially for for the virus itself. Yeah. So I'm afraid. Um, I'm sorry, Mike. I can't really. Yeah. Give anything okay. Uh, we've got a question from Clive. Yes, um, I'm very pleased to see that the evening offer pound after seven is continuing, as I understand it. I would like to suggest, though, perhaps it starts slightly earlier at six or six thirty, because if you're going into for something in into Leeds or Bradford or wherever else, you probably need to be there by about seven thirty. So seven o'clock isn't going to encourage people going in uh, uh, so much. And the other thing will be publicity. I know you have a very good weekend deal for families, yep. but it's only because I've been told. I've never seen it on any bus, out, out on bus advertising at the back of the bus or anywhere. So I think both those, if you could promote them more, that would be great. And the other thing people do tell me about is the cost of short fares. So for people where I live, they'll tend to get an Uber to go locally to the shops rather than use the bus because the short fares are actually relatively expensive to com compare to Uber. So I think that's something, I don't know what you can do about it. I suppose it's cheaper short fares really, isn't it? But uh, publicity, I think, is the, the key thing for these offers and uh, more of that, please. Yes, Clive. Um, thank you, and and hi. Uh, yes, I've I've taken a note of, of all of those points. I, just, I think when when I said that we are reviewing the evening offer, that's what we're doing. We're reviewing it and and ensuring that it will fit for purpose um, going forwards. In exactly how that pans out, will will be down to the commercial and revenue team, and they'll they'll deliver a decision based on on, on what they think is best uh, for the business. But you're absolutely right in terms of the timing of it um, and, and certainly the weekend deal that that has been around for a little while now. I'm certainly aware of it and I've seen it um, advertised um, quite well at times, but absolutely there's a piece of work that I guess we all need to do now in terms of encouraging the, 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 the use of bus um, at the right times, because as we see social and leisure activities increase and people make the most of the bounce back, let's face it, because people will want to get out and about and spend some time in the city centres and, and doing some of the leisure things that they haven't been able to do for a little while. So, no, I've, I've made a note of those. Thank you. OK, thanks. And Howard? Uh, this is probably a question that doesn't really have an answer, but uh, the thought occurs to me that um, with car drivers facing large increases in the price of petrol and diesel, uh, might we actually see um, uh, significant numbers of people uh, leaving their cars at home and starting to use public transport more? Um, I mean, and I guess probably from your point of view, maybe the key is probably planning flexibly because uh, we, we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, you're absolutely you're absolutely right, Howard. I um, I discussed this with our commercial team um, some time ago uh, when when the the cost of living crisis started to kick in, and then we've got to remember that we've got a whole group of people that have just left school or colleges that maybe haven't gone into the working world in the same way that others um, did some time ago. So yes, there's there's probably a different group of people that have never really felt the working world in the way that. A lot of people on this call have have felt um, when when we were younger. So th there's a lot of people starting off down that down that road to to work and and, and leisure and, and getting out and about. And it's a, probably at the most expensive time that we've that any of us have seen. So yes, very much taken on board, Howard. But there's a no answer. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Will? If not, we'll go to Arriva with uh, Dwayne Wells, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so um, uh, across the network, um, we're, we're seeing some, uh, some uh, good recovery. 84% um, of passengers are, are now travelling with us versus, uh, versus pre-pandemic, which, uh, which is good and growing, so that's, uh, that's to be welcomed. Um, we are, however, struggling um, across uh, across our network from a driver shortage, as has been sort of mentioned previous. 
Uh, I'm afraid to say for, for us, that's certainly worsening um, rather than getting better. Um, but we have a lot of activity to attract new drivers, um, an intensive recruitment campaign on social media um, and adverts on the back of our buses. Um, working with the DVLA to fast track uh, provisional license applications uh, so that we can increase the number of trainees in our school. Um, temporarily increasing our starter rate for existing PCV license holders uh, to a higher rate of pay. Um, and as Will mentioned previously, we've, uh, we've launched a new uh, website, West Yorkshire Bus Jobs, uh, with our partners in the West Yorkshire Bus Alliance too. Uh, so fingers crossed, all that activity will see, uh, we'll, we'll see that position improve. Um, I updated uh, you last time about Leeds City Council's decisions regarding Crampine Road um, to make it a single, a single lane with, uh, with speed humps. Um, given that the, the impact of this is 1.2 million bus passengers every year across one of Leeds' busiest bus corridors, um, we have been campaigning to alter those plans, but regrettably without success. Um, and as many of you may have seen, we've diverted our services away from Crown Point Road and Leeds City College as a result of that. Um, we're now uh, campaigning the council to make amendments to Black Bull Street, um, which we hope um, will ensure that we can reconnect to the college. Um, and we would appreciate any support that um, any of the committee can offer on this. Um, and that's the update from the review auction. Okay, Happy to take any thanks. questions. Um, I was approached by someone who used to use the X25 to come to work in Leeds and now has a very much extended journey time. Is, is that a temporary withdrawal or a permanent one? Um, it, unfortunately, not temporary. That's that's a permanent a permanent withdrawal. Um, but if you'd like to send me some details as to as to where they travel to and from, we can look at the best options for them. Okay, uh, I don't know if I have your email address, so perhaps you could. Uh... I'll send that in the chat. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. Any questions for Dwayne, please? No. Okay. Uh, we haven't. Uh, got anything yet from Trans Pennine, so we can come back to that later. Um, and we're also waiting for Andrew to return to do his presentation. Um, item 10 on the agenda is actually part and parcel of Andrew's presentation, which is item six. Um, so that leaves us to the last item on the list until Andrew returns. Uh, which is public transport after the pandemic. Um, well, there's a lot of things that have happened. is isn't just the, the lockdown and uh, all the issues over the pandemic, um, but there's also the, the, the things such as um, the change in working patterns, which that has induced, uh, as well as the now the, the fuel crisis, which is getting a lot of motorists probably trying to... Um, sort of cut down on the amount of uh, journeys they're making. So it would be interesting to have people's views on what they like to see, to see the future to be, um, uh, or what they, they guess the future will be. I mean, it's very difficult to predict at the moment. Um, in fact, there's a Lord's inquiry going out which actually ask people to predict what the, the travel patterns will be, and because there's, there's no answer to that. Um, so does anyone have any views as to the, the pros and cons of the, what the future holds? Okay. Uh, sorry, do you mind if I just say there, there is um, a presentation on this as well, uh, which I think Andrew was going to deliver. I think there are, there are a few slides. Um, ah, right. So, I mean, I don't know if it's worth either putting those up as a sort of uh, maybe discussion thing, but I don't know if it'd be worth, um, you probably know, sort of Andrew best. delivering that if he had more, yeah, probably more to worth. say. Best wait until he returns. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Kim. Yeah, and um, I suppose we're still in uncertain times, but I think part of the conversation we've had today is in terms of the rising cost of fuel. And I think there's a big marketing piece around how much it costs you to travel by transport and, and what you would save by leaving the car at home in terms of parking, wear and tear and, and, and fuel and how we get that modal shift. I think it's really important, obviously, because of this, uh, the climate challenge that we all face. That actually, public transport has got to be um, really a number one priority in West Yorkshire. So I suppose there's a couple of things. We, the bus operators, we're waiting for the BSIC funding um, to come through. 
Um, we've never had more. Uh, we, we've put a strong BC forward. I would say it's one of the best in the country. Um, but obviously, um, I would say that because we, we we spent a lot of time doing it. But you know, the feedback I'm getting that it it's been well received. It's just a shame that the funding has been um, cut from three billion um, in ha uh, reduced down to fifty percent of of what was supposed to be going out for bus. Um, in terms of uh, rail, bus and rail across West Yorkshire, we've, we've set our aspirations high and even though we are still campaigning for NPR and HS2, there's a lot of small changes that we can do in West Yorkshire to make sure that we've got a metro style system across West Yorkshire. So I think, you know, we, we're going we're gonna to have to work hard collectively to bring passengers back. Um, in West Yorkshire, the figures that I've seen across the country, both bus and rail, are trending a lot higher than other places in the country. So there's a platform to build on. But the BSIP will be a big part of it for bus because that will give us the opportunity um, to look at fares. And, and that's what it's all about, is the fares and the service and get those frequencies right. We've never had more... Um, Pipe, we have got a strong pipeline of bus priority corridors, but there's also the things like, you know, the um, highway signalling, all of that has to come into play. I think every district across West Yorkshire has to play the part in this. And we know that when we put, get the offer right on bus, um, our under 19s, um, we're back at 100% return on those. And when we do more marketing over the summer, that will go even higher. So it's a combination of the operators working together um, and making sure that we get the marketing right, that we get the offers right. We have to be like retailers um, because retailers, I worked in retail for 19 years and they never stop. Every week they're putting a different out offer out to the customer, they know the DNA of the customer. Um, and it's about giving something back as well. So. One of the retailers that I shop with just recently, I got £15 of shopping back, and that drives me back to their stores. So we have to get the offer for bus and rail absolutely right. And so I'm quite positive about the future because I think politically sooner or later, there's going to be some big decisions made around the car. There's got to be. Um, and um, we have to be ready. We have to give people an um a credible alternative to using the car. Else, we're going to be stuck in congestion forever. We're going to have people um, where we're, what we're having to put money into because their health is failing because of, of the air quality. Um, so public transport, I think, you know, it's a number one priority for everybody, not on this call, but right across the industry and getting that message over to the public. Um, and sometimes I think often, sort of negativity in the press and we talk it down instead of talking public transport up. Mm. So I think we just have to talk it up. So I so, sort of filled a gap where well, hoping Andrew would be back from the school room. <laughs> if not yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's really interesting actually. Um, and I think he's absolutely right. Um, I, I think one thing we're struggling with a bit at the moment is this um, there are many expansions of the road network, which is going to lead to increased traffic, as we know from past history. And yes, a lot of local authorities are wanting dramatic reductions in uh, private car use. I mean, North Yorkshire recently wants a 48% reduction. Uh, and I sometimes wonder if the people who have come up with this are really the same people who are dealing with the, the duelling of the outer ring road at York. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other issues in West Yorkshire you, you could pick out. Um, th this is a, a difficult one. Uh, I, I don't know if you've got a view on that, Kim, and, and how we get that balance right. I mean, obviously, if it's a new estate, you need an access road. Uh, but yeah. when you're talking about dueling roads, knowing that there's going to be an increase in car traffic, which would extract from buses, um, that, that worries me. I think, I think on roads, I've always been quite open and said that, you know, we've got probably roads in the transport fund that are not fit for purpose anymore. I'm never, you're never going to be able to say that we won't be building roads because I think we probably still do need roads. And 
we're never going to be a country where you you know on certain occasions you don't need a car it's how we get the balance right but i think the work that wica are doing on um the mitigation of carbon in schemes has got a long way to go it's early days but actually we're one of the first authorities to have a look at um carbon not within just road building but in house building um, and I have seen some of that work and it is really revolutionary, but you need that data and that to, to actually influence and shape these decisions that are made. Um, and obviously um, that comes in with planning. So what tends to happen at planning, and, and sometimes it's come to me as chair, and I'm pleased that wrote the highway schemes are now going to go to the new transport committee, is that sometimes I'll get... Um, I'll be asked to comment on schemes and there's no public transport intervention in the scheme. And that should be the first thing that planners are looking at and asking that question. It's no good coming back later and saying, oh, as part of the section 106 agreement, we'll give people some free passes. Well, no, actually you needed to plan the bus around all that new development. And I think in the connectivity strategy, we've planned uh, for transport to be at the new employment zones and um and new housing development but that will mean that operators on bus will need to probably look at what their models look like in the future because if the routes have been taken away where they've got, not got a high patronage then are there different places that they can serve where they would get that patronage that would get people out of cars and i think the transdev model that vermouth the vermouth model in burnley is one of those classic examples where um, Boohoo asked um, Transdev to put in a service um, for all the shift patterns, and that's become a commercial service. Um, and as so as these employment zones develop across West Yorkshire and these housing developments come across West Yorkshire. So one that's on my radar is Dewsbury Riverside. There's going to be 2,000 to 3,000 properties there. So how do we make sure that the public transport is absolutely meets the needs of all those residents so i think it's we will be working differently and i think what operators will have to work differently yeah yeah i think there's been quite a, a lot in the media about uh, new housing development classic mm -hmm. examples where there's one the other day where it didn't even have any pavements um howard you've got a question um, just something else that's uh, relevant to that discussion is that Highways England have recently been consulting on um, changes to the, the Loft House interchange, uh, which is the junction between the M1 and the M62. Uh, and they've consulted on three options, which is basically replacing the current roundabout and then um, one flyover uh, and then a full works option with replacing the roundabout for, with three flowing uh, flyovers. Um, and um, the result of the consultation is that 84% of people favoured the, the full works option uh, with, with the uh, full flyovers. Um, and uh, I suppose to, to my mind, I, I have problems with that consultation because no, no indicative costs were given to the different options. So if, if you asked people, where would you like to go on holiday? Would you like to go to Filey? Gran Canaria or Tahiti, but you don't tell people what the cost is of the holiday and how, or how long we're going to need to be away. It wouldn't be surprising if everybody said Tahiti sort of thing. Um, now, I suppose the demand projections for traffic that Highways England are using are, are very large increases, which are really totally at odds with the sort of increases in uh, sort of a forecast for traffic that both Wyker and Leeds City Council are using. So, so I, I just wonder, it, it, I suppose, is there any dialogue between Wyker and the City Council and Highways England over schemes like that? So I think when planning permission, uh, bit new developments uh, 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 take place near to uh, the, the strategic highways network, Highways England have to be consultant about that. Does it work the other way around? That if Highways England are making changes, uh, do, do uh, uh, local authorities have to be consulted about that? Because I presume if, if that extra demand materialises, they're all going to come off the motor, all the vehicles will come off the motorways onto the uh, highways that Leeds City Council and WICA are responsible for. 
Uh, Kim, do you have any comments? Um, no, we're going to pass that one to Kate. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so, yes, we were involved in the consultation. Um, we actually saw sight of those costs and I did express a similar concern that how can you expect people to make a value judgment until you're able to put it in context. The response the City Council went back with was with, that we felt that the level of investment did not deliver value for money because that option was well in excess of 500 million pounds um, and the fact that it would um, create additional road capacity and by default additional road trips which were contrary to what we were trying to achieve from a strategy perspective in terms of reduced road miles and car trips. Um, and I know why we're involved in those discussions as well, Councillor Groves, because you know some of the colleagues were there and they'd sent their Justin um, sent a similar sort of response, really. OK, thanks. Uh, Clive, you've got a question? Well, it really, just um, as regards new developments, I'm just thinking back to previous experience and Hyroid's um, conversion with 500 homes in Menston was uh, supposed to have buses uh, linking it to um, routes into Leeds. But 17 years on, that never happened. The developer managed to avoid it. So it's a difficult one and uh, it does need addressing, but I'm not sure how that's done in terms of planning law. So there's that. And the other aspect, I guess, to make, uh, to improve things, I'm just thinking of my personal situation. What would make me leave my car at home? And I often, I often do. Um, and that is for, but for other people and me, if the bus is quicker than the car, then it's a no-brainer. But if the bus gets stuck in traffic and uh, you, you're waiting at a bus stop and you can't rely on it, then your car looks a better option. So I think that the key to a lot of this is bus priority. And there seems to have been a sort of, there was a big rollout, I think, in the 70s, and that stopped. And you've got my backdrop behind me. That is a road. It's outside the ring road, but of course, a lot of the people driving into Leeds are from outside um, the ring road. And there's room there for a bus priority lane, but it's never been there. It's all about priorities. And I don't know how priorities are agreed, but I would like to see our key bus routes individually examined for where bus priority would make the journey quicker by bus than by car. And I think until that's the case, I think it's really quite hard to persuade car drivers to get the bus. Okay. I'm happy to come back on that. Yeah, like okay, Kim, yeah. Yeah, like we've got the biggest um, bus priority schemes that we've ever had at Wyker um, in terms of numbers. Um, sorry about that. I would uh, basically say I totally agree with you, Clive, until we can do that reallocation of road space. And if I could have a, um, a wish list, it would be that we reallocate as much space as possible to bus. And that is the only way we are going to drive numbers is how reallocating that road space. I've even uh, looked at places like, you know, where we've just put the cycling in on Dewsbury Road. It's a dual carriageway. Why don't we reallocate, you know, another lane for bus? Because that's a key corridor. West Midlands, and, and we're doing really well because Leeds City Council, obviously, through the Liptic funding, have got all these new bus priority corridors going in. And it's a world of difference when you're travelling from Sturton Park and Ride um, along those new corridors. So we know that it works. We've just got a lot more work to do on it because my fear is we'll get electric cars, but we'll still have congestion. Um, so, so we need to make a big shift. Okay, thanks very much. And Andrew, uh, and, uh, uh, Andrew, yeah, welcome back. Uh, we've covered everything on the agenda apart from your presentation, so you're, you're free to uh, proceed with that. Okay, thank you, and I'm, I hope you weren't having to fill too much time, Mark. But um, thank you for doing that, and thank you for uh, bearing with my childcare arrangements. Um, Right, I'm going to try and share this and we'll see if it works.
can you see that? Can you see a screen that says policy and delivery programs for 22 to 23? Yes. Eureka, it works. Right, let's see if I can take it one step further and go on to the next screen. That will be a, that will be a wonder of science if I can. Um, I'm going to try and rattle through this relatively quickly. How do you get onto the next screen? He asks. Has that gone to the next screen? Yes, it has, oh, yeah. Amazing, two out of two. So uh, we're going to canter through some information about uh, the bus, bus service improvement plan, some general information about buses uh, and how we foresee the next few years working out, and then um, uh, rail and, uh, and, and some other discussion or some other focus on uh, demand responsive transport. This presentation will be emailed out to all of you. Uh, so I appreciate that you haven't seen it before now, but you will get copies of it. Uh, so if I rattle through any of it and miss some detail off it, it's only because I'm trying to pick out the main points for you. So our bus service improvement plan, which hopefully you have already seen uh, was published back in October 2021. It's on our website as well, the, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority website, and sets out ambitions for local buses uh, and the interventions that we want to put in place that we believe will make the bus better for the future. And we are still waiting for the DFT, Department for Transport, to tell us uh, whether we're going to get any money and how much money we're going to get if we are going to get some money. We want to deliver. Um, some of the elements of the BSIP, as I'm going to refer to it now, irrespective of whether we win this money or not, because we regard it as being really important for some of the reasons that Clive, for instance, has just been uh, making reference to just now. And uh, we also want to try and deliver some of the quick wins through our enhanced partnership, which I'll come back to uh, shortly. So the quick wins, as it were, are listed there on the left hand side uh, of, of, of of the right-hand side of the screen and the um, what we're referring to as short-term wins uh, for the next two years are on the right-hand side of the screen. So I think what would be really helpful, and I'll come back to this screen at the end if I may, but if you could uh, muse on whether you think we've missed anything, particularly in the short-term wins section, it, it really would be very helpful for us to understand whether you think there's more we could be doing, more that we should be doing, et cetera. So moving on then, bus reform is an agenda that's been talked about quite a lot, uh, both by uh, our mayor, Tra Tracy Brabin, but also uh, more, more nationally in terms of bus reform being a key trigger for funding to be released. And we're committed uh, to an enhanced partnership with the West Yorkshire bus operators. We're going through the process at the moment of entering that enhanced partnership. And uh, it, it's key to note that it's a specific legal agreement. It's not just a voluntary partnership that we can magic out. It's a, it's a statutory partnership here. It requires two elements that we produce a plan that reflect the vision and objectives of the BSIP for the next five years. And then at least one enhanced partnership scheme identifying how the plan will be delivered. And that relates to the A61 South scheme in Leeds. It's worthy of note that only Leeds City Council have made commitments within the scheme currently to highways infrastructure improvements. Uh, however, all of the local authorities are signatories. Uh, so our ambition is to add further bus uh, priority infrastructure schemes across the wider region in due course. And the enhanced partnership plan and that initial scheme on the A61 will be published on 31st of March of this year. The bottom there just lays out the, the uh, timescales beyond that. At the same time, we are adopting a twin track approach. So we've got the enhanced partnership that we're going ahead with to try and see if we can drive that bus, uh, the increase in bus patronage uh, through that. But at the same time, we're aware, well, you're aware rather, that the mayor's pledged to bring buses back under public control. And we are assessing the viability of franchising for, uh, the, for the West Yorkshire region. Franchising has got to follow a process set out by law, which includes the understanding of the case for change, 
and considering all of the options thoroughly, an independent audit and public consultation. This year, we've got quite a lot on our plate to deliver, as you can see from the list at the bottom of the screen. So that's what we're going to be doing this year alone to move that forward. In terms of rail, uh, the rail strategy to link from anywhere to anywhere in West Yorkshire, at least twice an hour. Now that's, that's what we want to do and to be door to door no slower than the car. I think that that's a, a laudable ambition for all of our, our, our area. And uh, I won't go into too much detail about that slide, but in terms of the uh, rail vision and the strategy, there are several high level principles that are being worked through to develop the uh, rail vision. And uh, we've got a number of commissions that are already in place. So in terms of the commissions, we're looking at the capacity needs, freight options, decarbonisation in the area, the contactivity need, connectivity needs, expanding the reach of rail, access integration, and major projects, um, post IIP studies as well. So this is a busy space at the moment, at the same time as Great British Railways is being formed slowly. So in the rail space, we have got real ambition but it's got to be recognised that that sits alongside the massive changes that are going about nationally and also uh, some of the major infrastructure pro projects that we have in our area as well. In terms of the IRP, the Integrated Rail Plan, there's some headlines here. So in terms of significant gaps, and these are, these are not new, these are not a secret. So HS2 East, we know about that. Um, Northern Powerhouse Rail, no new line via Central Bradford that we thought was going to come, or Northern Powerhouse Rail services uh, to the east of uh, Leeds to Hull, or York to the northeast, or to Sheffield indeed. Uh, no commitment to tackle Leeds station capacity, other than a further study to look at um, mass transit, and no new T-shaped station in Leeds. Although, uh, you know, I was quite staggered by that 700 football pitches worth of land has been uh, safeguarded for the purpose of HS2 still. And the only electrification, electrification commitment is between Leeds and Bradford, uh, but not the rest of the Calder Valley line, which obviously uh, presents some problems uh, for us and pr problems for the rail industry in terms of the rolling stock they could use. Lack of clarity, mass transit. What is, what's the funding situation there? Um, Transpennine route upgrade, the investment's welcomed, but there's significant disruption over a longer period and the viability of the proposal is questionable um, because of the impacts at expensive local rail services and freight indeed. East Coast mainline, faster journey times, yes, great, but not clear if it's deliverable and subject to business case. So there's no real firm commitment uh, or clear scope in that space. So we feel that overall, we in West Yorkshire are comparatively worse. We're getting less money in than uh, East Midlands and Greater Manchester, particularly. And, you know, as well as the pre-existing North-South divide, are we in danger of now having an East-West divide as well? Question. Uh, and all districts in West Yorkshire will be losing out. So it's not as if we can say, well, Leeds is winning and Bradford's losing or Wakefield's winning and, and uh, Kirklees is, you know, it, it's actually across the West Yorkshire region. It, it, it's a lose-lose, unfortunately. Next steps. So what are we doing about this? Transport Select Committee, um, the Mayor and Ben Still, our Managing Director, uh, provided evidence to the House of Commons Transport Select Committee on 24th of February, session held in Leeds. Uh, so they are listening the transport select committee at least is listening and they wanted to know uh how it would impact on the net zero and leveling up agendas and uh the mayor told uh told the transport select committee about some of the the stories that rail passengers have shared uh, and the committee also met with some local business representatives as well uh future integrated rail plan studies so several areas of work being looked at including uh, topics such as lead station capacity uh, and how to bring HS2 
to West Yorkshire and Leeds, potentially, as well as the Bradford electrification. And we're seeking clarity on the terms of reference for these studies and commitment from government that we will have a major role as the work progresses here, because without it, the local people are not able to comment on on uh, what's going on and, and what's being done in our area. So we're also looking to seek a, a closer working relationship with the rail industry on the uh, Transpennine route upgrade to ensure that we can maximise the benefits and mitigate against the disruption impacts of which there could be quite a few and have been already, although they have been, I have to say, been managed quite well so far. In terms of the city region sustainable transport settlement for rail, rail budget of around 20 million to be confirmed uh, with large scale improvements at rail stations for step free access to platforms, which is obviously positive, uh, and a package of smaller scale customer experience station improvements to support accessibility and inclusivity. And at lead station itself, platform extensions to platforms 13 and 17 for longer trains to the five towns and Huddersfield areas, which again is positive news. Moving on, demand responsive transport. So you will hopefully all be aware already that we have the East Leeds Flexibus currently in operation on an 18 month trial. DRT is typically provided using smaller bus vehicles and it's booked using an app or via a telephone line, but um, principally using a, an app on your mobile phone to take you from point to point, not your home, but from a, a defined point. So we're currently developing uh, up to five additional demand responsive schemes subject to funding again and working with districts to identify which the most appropriate areas for the demand responsive transport services will be. And in terms of mobility hubs, we've got uh, four sites currently being developed in Corderdale, obviously outside the area, uh, this area, and uh, an additional seven sites to be developed across West Yorkshire, again, awaiting funding confirmation and working with districts to identify the best locations for that. So the hubs will provide links with uh, rail, um, transforming city fund schemes, demand responsive transport, future mass transit, obviously the bus uh, and, and other cycling infrastructure and, and uh, other um, uh, potential transport options such as car share and car club as well, and looking to uh, co-locate them with areas where community facilities already exist like libraries and, and doctor surgeries. That's the operational area of the East Leeds Flexibus, just in case you weren't aware. And I don't know whether any of you have used it, but if you have, feedback is always welcome. Um, and and uh, certain, certainly in terms of the quality of the journey and the experience, but also any, any things that you as customers may have picked up that you think, oh, actually, if only it did this, or if only if it went there, or you know, whatever it may be, uh, we, we're always really uh, willing to listen uh, to, to what you've got to say. And because it's a trial, we've got the absolute opportunity at relative short notice, relatively short notice, to change things up on the service. So uh, finally, transport projects starting and completing on site in 22-23. So here is a list of the uh, projects that are on site now and will be on site uh, fairly soon. Uh, Leeds bus station is drawing to a close now. Well, I say drawing to a close, it's certainly well underway to, to getting completed, which is positive. Uh, and obviously, there's a whole heap of stuff going on in the city centre at the moment. And uh, that's just a conclusion of those things, including the White Rose Rail Station that we've already talked about today. And that is that. So um, I'll hand back. If you've got any questions, let's see if I can stop sharing my screen. Okay, has that stopped sharing? You. Yep, it has. Thank you very much. So any questions, please? No, okay. Wow, uh, well, I got off lightly. Yeah. Oh, no, Clive's got, I'm, Clive, I'm, he's on Clive, mute, though. Yeah. I'm here. I can't get let you guess off that lightly. So how are 
projects determined? How are they prioritized? Is there an overall master plan with costs and whatever? So you can weigh up one project against another. Is it is that something that exists? I, I just wonder how how certain projects seem to come to the front and others don't, nothing happens. I mean, the, 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 from my perspective, and others may wish to chip in, but um, in terms of the cost benefit analysis that's undertaken, that's key, really. How much does it cost? And what are, going to, what are the benefits going to be to uh, the various people that are going to be using uh, the, the in, improved uh, highways upgrade? So whether it's uh, in terms of, I mean, uh, Kate referred earlier to the sort of modal hierarchy, and by that I mean putting active travel at the top of the tree. So our walking, people walking, pedestrians, cyclists going to benefit, our bus users going to benefit. All of those things will play in to the decisions that are taken about which schemes are, are moved forward. But there's a whole heap of other analysis that has to go on in terms of evaluating uh, the schemes, both in terms of deliverability and and you know that can be in terms of disruption while you're doing it, but but also in terms of potentially things like land acquisitions. So it is is it possible to get this thing off the ground at all? You know, within a reasonable period of time. But Kate, I don't really want to add to that particularly. I think one other element is it depends on the funding source. DFT can be quite prescriptive about what we can and can't spend certain pots of money on. So the active travel fund, for instance, is very much around walking and cycling. Obviously, the BSIP funding into an element that Crest's funding, the city region, say North Transport Settlement, is very much around kind of bus um, interventions and transformational um, sustainable schemes. So I think you're right. You know, Andrew's talked on the, the benefit cost ratio, but it also has to align with what the funds are trying to achieve and the policy that sits behind that. So where do the suggestions come from? Can I suggest to you, and you might decide that it's no use at all, my suggestion, but how? Do, what's the process whereby suggestions get put forward? So, so there, there is a portal, my understanding, on the Connecting Leads website where you can put comments in generally, just across the whole of the network. Um, we often have things that come through, obviously, our ward members that may put forward suggestions, or it may be, it, it's more a kind of a root and a branch review in terms of we work very closely with WICA. So for instance, as part of the BSIP work, there's been a wholesale review of the network, where are the real challenges in terms of bus journey times, and where would you get the best return on that investment in terms of change of journey time? And often, the benefits cost ratio is driven by obviously the number of users as well. So it tends to be obviously on the core network. Um, but, you know, or I've put, I've put my um, my address in the, the chat previously. By all means, you know, you can put that through and we can feed that into, into the list that we've got. Thank you. Okay, um, Leslie. Yeah, I just wonder how the Wicker list of projects relates to other projects being done locally, which I'm sort of familiar with. I mean, I'm, last few weeks I've been involved in two A660 schemes and a, a Lawnswood Roundabout scheme. How, uh, uh, what, what's the divide? I mean, how, what's what in these schemes? So the, the, how, do the they, funding, how do they mesh together? The funding for both of those come through Wicker. But they're not on the um, list. They're, 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 you know, no, I presume Andrew's pulled out the largest scale. It, it, it gets quite complicated. What it tends to be done is driven by the pots of funding. So we have the West Yorkshire Transport Fund, and there's a number of projects that have been identified that. We had the Transforming Cities Fund hmm. um, that had those. We had the Active Travel Fund. So the A660 is actually coming out of the Active Travel Fund element of it. The Lawnswood is now actually part and parcel of the City Region Sustainable Transport Fund. Um, so although they they roll up around the separate funds, mm. I could do have that oversight. But as I said, each fund has a slightly different dynamic in terms of the directive then will have come down from DFT mm. as to what is eligible and how to spend that money. Right. 
Um, but but we as leads obviously also look holistically across the network. So we're doing a piece of work at the moment looking at the road hierarchy and interventions of the network of roads within the um, inner ring road. We will then do the same in terms of the wider city in terms of how we want to. And, and we touched on this a little bit, you know, there will be roads that we want to um, encourage the car use that we need to maintain to be on. So, for example, at the moment, you'll have seen Armley Gyratory is on there. Yes. We are creating additional capacity because we will be closing City Square. Mm. So there will be additional traffic that goes through Armley because we feel that it is it is a more appropriate route for those cars such that actually we can provide the enhanced bus priority and walking and cycling that goes up through City Square. Um, so we do also join, join the dots and look more holistically in terms of that network of interventions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions on the presentation, uh, there are just uh, a few things that come to my mind. Uh, firstly, we haven't heard from Transpennan Express, and I assume Liz is having problems because she's travelling. So possibly a, a report could be circulated to us at a later stage. Um, uh, I've, we're hearing rumours that these district committees may not continue in the same format or may not continue at all. Is, is there any news on that you can give us, Andrew, or is it all unknown? It, um, so my understanding is that they won't uh, continue in the same format in that they won't be uh, formal council meetings or yeah, formal West Yorkshire combined authority meetings, but our absolute desire and ambition is for them to continue so that we have the opportunity for uh, users and operators and ourselves as a combined authority alike and actually for councillors, uh, the relevant councillors to attend as well. Uh, so it's, it's just changing up the format a bit and reviewing how they, how, how they work moving forward uh, as ever and, and you know, dare I say it, to, to try and perhaps secure uh, the views of a wider selection of uh, public transport users and users of, of the highway network as well. Okay. And uh, finally, um, I understand, having read South Lee's life, uh, Kim, that you're not going to continue on the council. And I uh, would like to thank you for your work and, uh, well, we'll miss you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, I've done 12 years as a politician, I think. I think that's enough that's my stint yeah. up. <laughs> i've enjoyed it but i'm sure that i'll keep actively involved in transport because i've mm. become very passionate about it so okay. i might be joining you at these meetings as a resident <laughs> all right look forward to that so if there's nothing else uh, i think it leaves me to close the meeting so thank you for attending everyone and uh, no doubt we'll see you soon thanks mark thank Goodbye. you mark thank you Bye. Bye. Cheers, goodbye.